Love and Honour and Pity and Pride and Compassion and Sacrifice by Nam Lee. My father arrived on a rainy morning. I was dreaming about a poem, the dull fluck flunk of a typewriter's keys punching out the letters. It was a good poem, perhaps the best I'd ever written. When I woke up, he was standing outside my bedroom door, smiling ambiguously. He wore black trousers and a wet, wrinkled parachute jacket that looked like it had just been pulled out of a washing machine. Framed by the bedroom doorway, he appeared even smaller, gaunter than I remembered. Still groggy with dream, I lifted my face toward the alarm clock. What time is it? Hello, son, he said in Vietnamese. I knocked for a long time, then the door just opened. The fields are glass, I thought. Then tum ti ti, a dactyl, n line. Then the words excuse, an alloy, and the line after. Come on, I thought. It's raining heavily, he said. I frowned. The clock read 11.44. I thought you weren't coming until this afternoon. It felt strange after all this time to be speaking Vietnamese again. They changed my flight in Los Angeles. Why didn't you ring? I tried, he said equably. No answer. I twisted over the side of the bed and cracked open the window. The sound of the rain filled the room. Rain fell on the streets, on the roofs, on the tin shed across the parking lot like the drumming of a thousand fingertips. Everything smelled of wet leaves. I turned the ringer off when I sleep, I said. Sorry. He continued smiling at me, significantly, as if waiting for an announcement. I was dreaming. He used to wake me when I was young by standing over me and smacking my cheeks lightly. I hated it. The wetness, the sourness of his hands. Come on, he said, picking up a large Adidas duffel and a roll bundle that looked like a sleeping bag. A day lived. A sea of knowledge earned. He loved speaking in Vietnamese proverbs. I had long since learned to ignore it. I threw on a t-shirt and stretched my neck in front of the lone window. Through the rain, the sky was as grey and sharp as graphite. The fields of glass. Like a shape in smoke, the poem blurred, then dissolved into this new, cold, strange reality. A wind-blown, rain strafe parking lot. A dark room almost entirely taken up by my bed, the small body of my father dripping water onto hardwood floors. I went to him, my legs goose pimpled underneath my pyjamas. He watched with pleasant indifference as my hands reached for his, shook it, then relieved his other hand of the bag. You must be exhausted, I said. He had flown from Sydney, Australia, 33 hours all up, transiting in Auckland, Los Angeles, and Denver before touching down in Iowa. I hadn't seen him in three years. You'll sleep in my room. Very fancy, he said, as he led me through my own apartment. You even have a piano. He gave me an almost rueful smile. I knew you'd never really quit. Something moved behind his face, and I found myself back on a heightened stool with my fingers chasing the metronome, ahead and behind, trying to shut out the tutor's repeated sighing, his heavy brass ruler. I realised I was massaging my knuckles. My father patted the futon in my living room. I'll sleep here. You'll sleep in my room, Ba. I watched him warily as he surveyed our surroundings, messy with books, papers, dirty plates, teacups, clothes. I'd intended to tidy up before going to the airport. I work in this room anyway, and I work at night. As he moved into the kitchen, I snatched the three-quarters full bottle of Johnny Walker from the second shelf of my bookcase and stashed it under the desk. I looked around. The desktop was gritty with cigarette ash. I threw some magazines over the roughest spots, then flipped one of them over because its cover bore a picture of Chem and Mayo. I quickly gathered up the cigarette packs and sleeping pills and incense burners and dumped them all on a higher shelf behind my Kafka vintage classics. At the kitchen swing door, I remembered the photo of Linda beside the printer. Her glamour shot, I called it. Hair windswept and eyes squinty, smiling at something out of the frame. One of her ex-boyfriends had taken it at Lake McBride. She looked happy. I snatched it and turned it face down, covering it with scrap paper. As I walked into the kitchen, I thought, for a moment, that I had left the fire escape open. Rainwater gushed along gutters, down through the pipes. Then I saw my father at the sink, 
Slaves rolled up, sponge in hand, washing the month-old crusted mound of dishes. The smell was awful. Ah, I frowned. You don't need to do that. His hands, hard and leathery, moved deftly in the sink. Bah, I said half-heartedly. I'm almost finished. He looked up and smiled. Have you eaten? Do you want me to make some lunch? Hoy, I said, suddenly irritated. You're exhausted. I'll go out and get us something. I went back through the living room into my bedroom, picking up clothes and rubbish as I went. You don't have to worry about me, he called out. You just do what you always do. The truth was, he'd come at the worst possible time. I was in my last year at the Iowa Writers' Workshop. It was late November, and my final story for the semester was due in three days. I had a backlog of papers to grade, and a heap of fellowship and job applications to draft and submit. It was no wonder I was drinking so much. I told Linda only the previous night that he was coming. We were at her place. Her body was slippery with sweat and hard to hold. Her body smelled of her clothes. She turned me over, my face kissing the bed sheets, and then she was chopping my back with the edges of her hands. Higher, out a bit more. She had trouble keeping a steady rhythm. Softer, I told her. Moments later, I started laughing. What? The sheeps were damp beneath my pressed face. What? Softer, I said, not slower. She slapped my back with the meat of her palms. Hard. Once, twice. I couldn't stop laughing. I squirmed over and caught her by the wrists. Hunched forward, she was blushing and beautiful. Her hair fell over her face. Beneath its ash-blonde hem, all I could see were her open lips. She pressed down into me, her shoulders kinking, the long, lean curve from the back of her neck to the small of her back. Stop it, her lips said. She rested her hands free. Fingers beneath my waistband, violent, the scratch of her nails down my thighs, knees, ankles. I pointed my feet like a ballet dancer. Afterward, I told her my father didn't know about her. She said nothing. You just don't talk about that kind of stuff, I explained. She looked like an actress who looked like my girlfriend. Staring at her face made me tired. I began to feel this way more often around her. He's only here for three days. Somewhere out of sight, a group of college boys hooted and yelled. I thought you didn't talk to him at all. He's my father. What's he want? I rolled toward her onto my elbow. I tried to remember how much I'd told her about him. We were lying on the bed, the wind loud in the room. I remember that, and we were both tipsy. Ours could have been two voices in the darkness. It's only three days, I said. The look on her face was strange, shut down. She considered me for a long time. Then she got up and pulled on her clothes. Just make sure you get your story done, she said. I drank before I came here too. I drank when I was a student at university and then when I was a lawyer in my previous life, as they say. There was a subterranean bar in a hotel next to my work, and every night I would wander down and slump on a bar stool and pretend I didn't want the bartender to make small talk with me. He was only a bit older than I, and I came to envy his ease, his confidence that any given situation was only temporary. I left exorbitant tips. After a while, I was treated to battered shrimps and shepherd's pies on the house. My parents had already split by then, my father moving to Sydney, my mother into a government flat. That's all I've ever done, traffic in words. Sometimes I still think about word counts, the way a general must think about his casualties. I'd been in Iowa for more, for more than a year. Days passed in weeks and months, more than a year of days. And I had written only four and a half stories, about 17,000 words. When I was working at the law firm, I would have written that many words in a couple of weeks and they would have been useful to someone. Deadlines came, exhausting, and I forced myself up to meet them. Then, in the great spans of time between, I fell back to my vacant screen and my slowly sludging mind. I tried everything, writing in longhand, writing in my bed, in my bathtub. As this last deadline approached, I remembered a friend claiming he'd broken his writer's block by switching to a typewriter. 
You're free to write, he told me. Once you know you can't delete what you've written. I bought an electric Smith Corona at an antique shop. It buzzed like a tropical aquarium when I plugged it in. It looked good on my desk. For inspiration, I read absurdly formal Victorian poetry and drank scotch neat. How hard could it be? Things happen in this world all the time. All I had to do was record them. In the sky, two swarms of swallows converged, pulled apart, interwove again, like veils drifting at cross currents. In the line of the supermarket, a black woman leaned forward and kissed the handle of a shopping cart, her skin dark and glossy like the polished wood of a piano. The week prior to my father's arrival, a friend harassed me for my persistent defeatism. Rider's block. Under the streetlights, vapours of bourbon puffed out of his mouth. How can you have writer's block? Just write a story about Vietnam. We had just come from a party following a reading by the workshop's most recent success, a Chinese woman trying to immigrate to America who had written a book of short stories about Chinese characters in stages of migration to America. The stories were subtle and good. The gossip was that she'd been offered a substantial six-figure contract for a two-book deal. It was meant to be an unspoken rule that such things were left unspoken. Of course, it was all anyone talked about. It's hot, a writing instructor told me at a bar. Ethnic literature's hot, and important too. A couple of visiting literary agents took a similar view. There's a lot of polished writing around, one of them said. You have to ask yourself, what makes me stand out? She tagged team to her colleague, who answered slowly, as though intoning a mantra. Your background and life experience. Other friends were more forthright. I'm sick of ethnic lit, one said. It's full of descriptions of exotic food. Or, you can't tell if the language is spare because the author intended it that way, or because he didn't have the vocab. I was told about a friend of a friend, a Harvard graduate from Washington, D.C., who had posed in traditional Nigerian garb for his book jacket cover. I pictured myself standing in a rice paddy, wearing a straw conical hat. Then I pictured my father in the same field, wearing his threadbare fatigues, young and hard-eyed. It's a licence to bore, my father said. We were drunk and wheeling our bikes because both of us separately had punctured our tyres on the way to the party. The character's always flat, generic. As long as a Chinese writer writes about Chinese people, or a Peruvian writer writes about Peruvians, or a Russian writer about Russians, he said, as though reciting children's doggerel, then stopped, losing his train of thought. His mouth turned up into a doubtful grin. I could tell he was angry about something. Look, I said, pointing at a floodlit porch ahead of us. Those guys have guns. As long as there's an interesting image or metaphor once in every this much text, he held out his thumb and forefinger to indicate half a page, his bike wobbling all over the sidewalk. I nodded to him, and then I nodded to one of the guys on the porch, who nodded back. The other guy waved us through with his faux-wood air rifle. A car with its headlights on was idling in the driveway, and girls' voices emerged from inside, squealing, Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Faulkner, you know, my friend said over the squeals. He said we should write about the old verities. Love and honour and pity and pride and compassion and sacrifice. A sudden sharp crack behind us, like the striking of a giant typewriter hammer, followed by some muffled shrieks. I know I'm a bad person for saying this, my friend said, but that's why I respect your writing, Nan. Because you could just write about Vietnamese boat people all the time, like in your third story. He must have thought my head was bowed in modesty, but in fact I was figuring out whether I'd just been shot in the back of the thigh. I felt a distinct sting. The pellet might have ricocheted off something. You could totally exploit the Vietnamese thing, but instead you choose to write about lesbian vampires and Colombian assassins and Hiroshima orphans and New York painters with hemorrhoids. For a dreamlike moment I was taken aback, catalogued like that under the bourbon stink of its breath. My story sank into unflattering relief. My leg was still stinging. I imagined sticking my hand down the back of my jeans, bringing it to my face under a streetlight and finding it gory, blood splattered. 
I imagine turning around, advancing wordlessly up the porch steps and drop kicking the two kids. I would tell my story into a microphone from a hospital bed. I would compose my story in a county cell. I would kill one of them, maybe accidentally, and never talk about it, ever, to anyone. There was no hole in my genes. I'm probably a bad person, my friend said, stumbling beside his bike a few steps in front of me. If you ask me why I came to Iowa, I would say that Iowa is beautiful in the way that any place is beautiful. If you treat it as the answer to a question you're asking yourself every day, just by being there. That afternoon, as I was leaving the apartment for Linda's, my father called out my name from the bedroom. I stopped outside the closed door. He was meant to be napping. Where are you going? His voice said. For a walk, I replied. I'll walk with you. It always struck me how everything seemed larger in scale on Summit Street. The double-storied houses, the smooth lawns sloping down from the sidewalks like golf greens. Elm trees with high, thick branches. The sort of branches from which I imagined fathers suspending long rope swings for their daughters in white dresses. The leaves, once golden and red, were turning dark orange and brown. The rain had stopped. I don't know why, but we walked in the middle of the road, dark asphalt gleaming beneath slick, pasted leaves, like the back of a whale. I asked him, What do you want to do while you're here? His face was pale and fixed in a smile. Don't worry about me, he said. I can just meditate or read. There's a coffee shop downtown, I said, and a Japanese restaurant. It sounded pathetic. He kept smiling, looking at the ground moving in front of his feet. I have to write, I said. You write. I realised I could no longer read his smile. He had perfected it during his absence. It was the setting of the lips, sly, almost imperceptible, which I probably associate with senility, but for the keen awareness of his eyes. There's an art museum across the river, I said. Ah, take me there. The museum? No, he said, looking sideways at me. The river. We turned back to Burlington Street and walked down the hill to the river. He stopped in the middle of the bridge. The water below looked cold and black, slowing in sections as it succumbed to the temperature. Behind us, six lanes of car skidded back and forth across the skin of the road and sounded like the shredding of wind. Have you heard from your mother? He stood upright before the railing, his head strangely small above the puffy down jacket I'd lent him. Every now and then. He lapsed into formal Vietnamese. How is the mother of Nan? She's good, I said loudly, too loudly, trying to make myself heard over the groans and clanks of a passing truck. He was nodding. Behind him, the east bank of the river glowed warmly in the afternoon light. Come on, I said. He crossed the bridge and walked to a nearby Dairy Queen. When I came out, two coffees in my hands. My father had gone down to the river's edge. Next to him, a bundled up, bearded figure stood over the burning gasoline drum. Never had I seen anything like it in Iowa City. This is my son, my father said, once I had scrambled down the wet bank. The writer. He took a hot paper cup from my hand. Would you like some coffee? Thank you, no. The man stood still, watching his knotted hands, palms glowing orange above the rim of the drum. His voice was soft, his clothes heavy with his life. I smelled the animals in him and fuel, rain. I read his story, my father went on in his lilting English, about Vietnamese boat people. He gazed at the man, straight into his blank, roomy eyes then said, as though delivering a punchline, we are Vietnamese vote people. We stood there for a long time, the three of us, watching the flames. When I lifted my eyes, it was dark. Do you have any money on you? My father asked me in Vietnamese. Welcome to America, the man said through his beard. He didn't look up as I closed his fist around the damp bills. My father was drawn to weakness, even as he tolerated none in me. He was a soldier, he said once, as if that explained everything. With me, he was all proverbs and regulations. No personal phone calls, no female friends, 
no extracurricular reading. When I was in primary school, he made me draw up a daily 10-hour study timetable for the summer holidays and punish me when I deviated from it. He knew how to cane me 20 times and leave only one black red welt, like a brand mark across my buttocks. Afterward, as he rubbed tiger balm on the wound, I would cry in anger at myself for crying. Once, when my mother let slip that durian fruit made me vomit, he forced me to eat it in front of guests. Duan Moin Kung Nung Hunger finds no fault with food. I learned to hate him with a straight face. When I was 14, I discovered that he'd been involved in a massacre. Later, I would come across photos and transcripts and books. But there, at a family friend's party in suburban Melbourne, and then, it was just another story in a circle of drunken men. They sat cross-legged on newspapers around a large blue tarpaulin, getting smashed on cheap beer. It was that time of night when things started to break up against other things. Red faces, raised voices, spilled drinks. We arrived late, and the men shuffled around, making room for my father. Tan, what took you so long? Scared? No? Sit down, sit down. Give him five bottles. The speaker swung around ferociously. We'll let you off. Everyone here has had eight, nine already. For the first time, my father let me stay. I sat on the perimeter of the circle, watching in fascination. A thicket of Vietnamese voices, cursing, toasting, braying about their children, making fun of one man who kept stuttering. It has the power of for f- 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 500 horses. Through it all, my father laughed good-naturedly, his face so red with drink, he looked sunburned. Bowl and chopsticks in his hands. He appeared somewhat childish, sitting between the two men trading war stories. I watched him as he picked sparingly at the enormous spread of dishes in the middle of the circle. The food was known as do and no, alcohol food. Massive, fatty oysters dipped in salt, pepper, lemon paste. Boiled sea snails. Large grilled crab legs. Southern-style bitter shredded chicken salad with brown, spotty rice crackers. Someone called out my father's name. He had set his chopsticks down and was speaking in a low voice. Heavens! The gunships came first. Rockets and M60s. You remember that sound, no? Like you were deaf. We were hiding in the bunker underneath the temple. My mother and four sisters and Mrs Tran, the baker and some other people. We couldn't hear anything. Then the gunfire stopped. and Mrs Tran told my mother we had to go up to the street. If we stayed there, the Americans would think we were Viet Cong. I'm not going anywhere, my mother said. They have grenades. Mrs Tran said, I was scared and excited. I'd never seen an American before. It took me a while to reconcile my father with the story he was telling. He caught my eye and held it for a moment. And so he and I were sharing a secret. He was drunk. So we went up. Everywhere there was dust and smoke, and all you could hear was the sound of helicopters and M16s, houses on fire. Then, through the smoke, I saw an American. I almost laughed. He wore his uniform so untidily, it was too big for him, and he had beaded necklace and a baseball cap. He held an M16 over his shoulder like a spade. Heavens, he looked nothing like the Viet Cong with their shirts tucked in and buttoned to their chins even after crawling through the mud tunnels all day. He picked up his chopsticks and reached for the Tiet Khan, a specialty, minced meat soaked in fresh congealed duck blood. Some of the other men were listening now, smiling knowingly. The story's teeth stained red as he chewed through the rest of his words. They made us walk to the east side of the village. There were about ten of them, about fifty of us. Mrs. Tran was saying, no VC, no VC. They didn't hear her. Over the sound of machine guns and the M79 grenade launchers. Remember those? Only I heard her. I saw pieces of animals all over the paddy fields. A water buffalo with its side missing, like it was scooped out by a spoon. Then, through the smoke, I saw Grandpa Long bowing to a GI in the traditional greeting. I wanted to call out to him. His wife and daughter and granddaughters, Mai and Kim, 
stood Charlie behind him. The GI stepped forward, hit the top of his head with the rifle butt, and then twirled the gun around and slid the bayonet into his neck. No one said anything. My mother tried to cover my eyes, but I saw him switch the fire selector on his gun from automatic to single shot before he shot Grandma Long. Then he and a friend pulled the daughter into a shack, the two little girls dragged along, clinging to her legs. They stopped us at the drainage ditch near the bridge. There were bodies on the road. A baby with only the bottom half of its head. A monk, his robe turned pink. I saw two bodies with the ace of spades carved into their chests. I didn't understand it. My sisters didn't even cry. People were now shouting, No VC! No VC! But the Americans just frowned and spat and laughed. One of them said something, then some of them started pushing us into the ditch. It was half full of muddy water. My mother jumped in and lifted my sisters down one by one. I remember looking up and seeing helicopters everywhere, some bigger than others, some higher up. They made us kneel in the water. They set up their guns on tripods. They made us stand up again. One of the Americans, a boy with a fat face, was crying and moaning softly as he re- reloaded his magazine. No VC, no VC. They didn't look at us. They made us turn around and kneel down in the water again. Then they started shooting. And I felt my mother's body jumping on top of mine. It kept jumping for a long time. And then everywhere was the sound of helicopters, louder and louder, like they were all coming down to land. And everything was dark and wet and warm and sweet. The circle had gone quiet. My mother came out from the kitchen, squatted behind my father and looped her arms around his neck. This was a minor breach of the rules. Heavens, she said. Don't you men have anything better to talk about? After a short silence, someone snorted, saying loudly, You win, Tan. You really did have it bad. And then everyone, including my father, burst out laughing. I joined in unsurely. They clinked glasses and made toast using words I didn't understand. Maybe he didn't tell it exactly that way. Maybe I'm filling in the gaps. But you're not under oath when writing a eulogy, and this is close enough. My father grew up in the province of Quang Nei, in the village of Son Mai, in the hamlet of Tu Kung, later known to the Americans as Mai Lai. He was 14 years old. Late that night, I plugged in the Smith Corona. It hummed with promise. I grabbed the bottle of scotch from under the desk and poured myself a double. Fuck it, I thought. I had two and a half days left. I would write the ethnic story of my Vietnamese father. It was a good story. It was a fucking great story. I fed in a sheet of blank paper. At the top of the page, I typed ethnic story in capital letters. I pushed the carriage return and scrolled down to the next line. The sound of helicopters in a dark sky. The keys hammered the page. I woke up late the next day. At the coffee shop, I sat with my typed pages and watched people come and go. They laughed and sat and sipped and talked and listening to them, I was reminded again that I was in a small town in a foreign country. I thought of my father in a dusky bedroom. He had kept the door closed as I left. I thought of how he looked when I last checked on him, his body lost in the blankets and his head so small among my pillows, his skin glassy in the blue glow of dawn. He was here now with me and already making the rest of my life seem unreal. I read over what I'd typed, thinking of him at that age, connecting him with who he would become. At a nearby table, a guy held out one of his iPod earbuds and beckoned his date to come around and sit beside him. The door opened and a cold wind blew in. I tried to concentrate. Hey! It was Linda wearing a large orange hiking jacket and bringing with her the crisp, bracing scent of all the places she'd been. 
Her face was unmaking a smile. What are you doing here? Working on my story. Is your dad here? No. Her friends were waiting by the counter. She nodded to them, holding up a finger, then came behind me, resting her hands on my shoulders. Is this it? She leaned over me, her hair grazing my face, cold and silken against my cheek. She picked up a couple of pages and read them soundlessly, as though praying. I don't get it, she said, returning them to the table. What are you doing? What do you mean? He never told me any of this. I shrugged. Did he tell you this? Now he's talking to you? Not really, I said. Not really? I turned around to face her. Her eyes reflected no light. You know what I think? She looked back down at the pages. I think you're making excuses for him. Excuses? You're romanticising his past, she went on quietly, to make sense of the things you said he did to you. It's a story, I said. What things did I say? You said he abused you. It was too much, these words, and what connected to them. I looked at her. Serious, beautifully lined face, her light trapping eyes, and already I felt them taxing me. I never said that. She took a half step back. Just tell me this, she said, her voice flattening. You've never introduced him to any of your exes, right? The question was tight on her face. I didn't say anything, and after a while she nodded, biting one corner of her upper lip. I knew that gesture. I knew even then that I was supposed to stand up, pull her orange jacket of body towards mine, speak words into her ear, but all I could do was think about my father and his excuses, those tattered bodies on top of him. For ten hours he waited, mud filling his lungs until nightfall. I felt myself falling back into old habits. She stepped forward and kissed the top of my head. It was one of her rules not to walk away from an argument without some sign of affection. I didn't look at her. My mother liked to tell the story of how, when our family first arrived in Australia, we lived in a hostel on an outer suburb street where the locals, whenever they met or parted, hugged and kissed each other warmly. How my father, baffled, charmed, had named it the Street of Lovers. I turned to the window. It was dark now, the evening settling thick and deep. A man and woman sat across from each other at a high table. The woman leaned forward, smiling, her breasts squat on the wood, elbows forward, her hands mere inches away from the man's shirt front. Throughout their conversation, her teeth glinted. Behind them, a mother sat with her son. I'm not playing, she murmured, flipping through her magazine. Elle, said the boy. I said, I'm not playing. Here is what I believe. We forgive any sacrifice by our parents, as long as it is not made in our name. To my father, there was no other name only mine, and he had named me after the homeland he had given up. His sacrifice was complete and compelled him to everything that happened. To all that, I was inadequate. At 16, I left home. There was a girl and heroin, and the possibility of greater loss than I had imagined possible. She embodied everything prohibited by my father and plainly worthwhile. Of course he was right about her. She taught me hurt. And promise. We were two animals in the dark, hacking at one another, and never since have I felt that way, that sense of consecration. When my father found out my mother was supporting me, he gave her an ultimatum. She moved into a family friend's textile factory and learned to use an overlock machine and continued sending money. Of course I want to live with him, she told me when I visited her, months later. But I want you to come home too. Bar doesn't want that. You're his son, she said simply. He wants you with him. I laundered my school uniform and asked a friend to cut my hair and waited for school hours to finish before catching the train home. My father excused himself upon seeing me. When he returned to the living room, he had changed his shirt and there was water in his hair. I felt sick and fully awake, as if all the previous months had been a single sleep and now my face was wet again, burning cold. The room smelled of peppermint. He asked me if I was well, and I told him I was. And then he asked me if my female friend was well. And at that moment I realised he was speaking not to me as a father, not as he would to his only son, 
but as he would speak to a friend, to anyone. And it undid me. I had learned what it was to attenuate my blood, but that was nothing compared to this. I forced myself to look at him, and I asked him to bring Ma back home. And child? Child will not take more money from Ma. Come home, he said finally. His voice was strangled, half swallowed. Even then, my emotions operated like a system of levers and pulleys. Just seeing him had set them irreversibly into motion. No, I said. The word shot out of me. Come home, and Ma will come home, and Ma promises child to never speak of any of this again. He looked away, smiling heavily, and took out a handkerchief. His forehead was moist with sweat. He had been buried alive in the warm, wet clinch of his family, crushed by their lives. I wanted to know how he climbed out of that pit. I wanted to know how there could ever be any correspondence between us. I wanted to know all of this, but an internal momentum moved me further from him as time went on. The world is hard, he said. For a moment I was uncertain whether he was speaking in proverbs. He looked at me, his face a gleaming mask. Just say yes, and we can forget everything. That's all. Just say it. Yes. But I didn't say it. Not that day, nor the next, nor any day for almost a year. When I did, though, rehabilitated and fixed in new privacies, he was true to his word and never spoke of the matter. In fact, after I came back home, he never spoke of anything much at all. And it was under this learned silence that the three of us, my father, my mother and I, were conducted irreparably into our separate lives. The apartment smelled of fried garlic and sesame oil when I returned. My father was sitting on the living room floor on the special mattress he had brought over with him. It was made of white foam. He told me it was for his back. I made some stir fry. Thanks. I read your story this morning, he said while you were still sleeping. Something in my stomach flipped over. I hadn't thought to hide the pages. There are mistakes in it. You read it? There were mistakes in your last story too. I tried to recall those sections where I'd been sloppy with research. Maybe the scene in Rock Gear, before they reached the refugee boat. I came out of the kitchen with a full plate of rice, marinated tofu, cashews and chickpeas. They're stories, I said, casually. Fiction. He paused for a moment, then said, Okay, son. My diet had consisted of chips and noodles and pizzas for so long, I'd forgotten how much I missed home cooking. As I ate, he stretched on his white mat. How's your back? I had a CAT scan, he said. There's nerve fluid leaking between my vertebrae. He smiled his long-suffering smile, right leg twisted across his left hip. I brought the scans to show you. Does it hurt, Bart? It hurts. He chuckled briefly, as though the whole matter were a joke. But what can I do? I can only accept it. Can't they operate? I felt myself losing interest. I was a bad son. Since he'd separated from my mother, he brought up his back pains so often always couched in Buddhist tenets of suffering and acceptance, that the cold, hard part of me suspected he was exaggerating, to solicit and then gently rebuke my concern. He did this. He'd forced me to take karate lessons until I was 16. Then, during one of our final arguments, he came at me and I found myself in a fighting stance. He had smiled at my horror. That's right, he'd said. We were locked in all the intricate ways of guilt. It took all the time we had to realise that everything we faced, we faced for the other as well. I want to talk with you, I said. You grow old, your body breaks down, he said. No, I'm in for the story. Talk? Yes. About what? He seemed amused. About my mistakes, I said. If you ask me why I came to Iowa, I would say that I was a lawyer, and I was no lawyer. Every 24 hours, I woke up at the smoggiest time of morning and commuted. Bus, tram, elevator, often without saying a single word, 
wearing clothes that chafed against me and holding a flat white in a white cup to my windowless office in the tallest, most glass-covered building in Melbourne. Time was broken down into six-minute units. Friends allotted eight-unit lunch breaks. I hated what I was doing, and I hated that I was good at it. Mostly, I hated knowing it was my job that gave my father pride and happiness. When I told him I was quitting and going to Iowa to be a writer, he said, Trab work, get draan. The captive buffalo hates the free buffalo. But by that time, he had no more control over my life. I was 25 years old. The thing is to write what no one else could have written, but to write what only you could have written. I recently found this fragment in one of my old notebooks. The person who wrote that couldn't have known what would happen. How time can hold itself against you. How a voice hollows. How words you once loved can wither on the page. Why do you want to write this story? My father asked me. It's a good story. But there are so many things you could write about. This is important, Bar. It's important that people know. You want their pity. I didn't know whether it was a question. I was offended. I want them to remember, I said. He was silent for a long time. Then he said, Only you'll remember. I'll remember. They will read and clap their hands and forget. For once, he was not smiling. Sometimes it's better to forget. No? I'll write it anyway, I said. It came back to me how I had felt at the typewriter the night before. A thought leapt into my mind. If I write a true story, I told my father, I'll have a better chance of selling it. He looked at me a while, searchingly, as though seeing something for the first time. Then he said in a considered voice, I'll tell you, but believe me, it's not something you'll be able to write. I'll write it anyway, I repeated. Then he did something unexpected. His face opened up and he began to laugh, without self-pity or slyness, laughing in full body breaths. I was shocked. I hadn't heard him laugh like this for a long time. Without fully knowing why, I started laughing too. His throat was humming in Vietnamese. Yes, 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 his eyes shining, smiling. All right, all right, but tomorrow, but I need to think, he said. He shook his head, then under his breath said, my son, a writer. Fine words will butter no parsnips. Um, I retorted, then translated, a scholar is a blessing for all relatives. He looked at me in surprise before laughing again and nodding vigorously. I've been saving that one up for years. Afternoon. We sat across from one another at the dining room table. I asked questions and took notes on a yellow legal pad. He talked. He talked about his childhood, his family. He talked about my lay. At this point, he stopped. You won't offer your father some of that? What? Heavens, you think you can hide liquor of that quality? The afternoon light came through the window and held his body in a silver square, slowly sinking toward his feet, dimming as he talked. I refilled our glasses. He talked about the peak hour traffic on the streets, its rinse of noise. He talked deep into the evening. When the phone rang for the second time, I unplugged the jack. He told me how he'd been conscripted into the South Vietnamese army. After what the Americans did? How did you fight in their sight? I had nothing but hate in me, he said. But I had enough for everyone. He paused on the word hate, like a father saying it before his infant child for the first time, trying the child's knowledge, testing what was inherent in the word and what learned. He told me about the war. He told me about meeting my mother, the wedding, then the fall of Saigon, 1975. He told me about his imprisonment and re-education camp, the forced confessions, the indoctrinations, the starvations, the daily labour that ruined his back, the casual killings. He told me about the tiger cage cells and the conix boxes, the different names for different forms of torture, the Honda, the airplane, the auto. They tie you by your thumbs, one arm over the shoulder, the other pulled around the front of the body or they stretch out your legs and tie your middle fingers to your big toes. He showed me, a skinny old man in tantra-like poses. He looked faintly preposterous. During the auto, he flinched, then immediately grinning, asked me to help him to his foam mattress. 
I waited impatiently for him to stretch it out. He asked me again to help. Here, push here, a little softer. Then he went on talking, sometimes in a low voice, sometimes smiling. Other times he would blink, furiously, perplexedly. In spite of his Buddhist protestations, I imagined him locked and raged, turned around and forced every day to re-witness these atrocities of his past, helpless to act. But that was only my imagination. I had nothing to prove that he was not empty of all that now. He told me how, upon his release after three years incarceration, he organised our family's escape from Vietnam. This was 1979. He was 25 years old then, and my father. When he finally fell asleep, his face was warm from the scotch. I watched him from the bedroom doorway. I was drunk. For a moment, watching him, I felt like I had drifted into a dream too. For a moment, I became my father, watching his sleeping son, reminded of what, for his son's sake, he had tried unceasingly to forget. A past larger than complaint, more perilous than memory. I shook myself conscious and went to my desk. I read my mo- notes through once, carefully all 45 pages. I reread the draft of my story from two nights before. Then I put them both aside and started typing never looking at them again. Dawn came so gradually, I didn't notice, until the beeping of a garbage truck that outside the air was metallic blue and the ground was white. The top of the tin shed was white. The first snow had fallen. He wasn't in the apartment when I woke up. There was a note on the coffee table. I'm going for a walk. I have taken your story to read. I sat outside on the fire escape with a tumbler of scotch waiting for him. Against the cold, I drank my whiskey, letting it flow like a filament of warmth through my body. I had slept for only three hours and was too tired to feel anything but peace. The red geraniums on the landing of the opposite building were frosted over. I spied through my neighbour's window and saw exactly nothing. He would read it, with his book learned English, and he would recognise himself in a new way. He would recognise me. He would see how powerful was his experience, how valuable his suffering how I had made it speak for more than itself. He would be pleased with me. I finished my scotch. It was 11.30 and the sky was dark and grey smeared. My story was due at midnight. I put my gloves on, treaded carefully down the fire escape and untangled my bike from the rack. He would be pleased with me. I rode around the block, up and down Summit Street, looking for a sign of my puffy jacket. The streets were empty. Most of the snow had melted but an icy film covered the roads and I rode slowly. Eyes stinging and breath fogging in front of my mouth, I coasted toward downtown, across the college green, the grass frozen so stiff it snapped beneath my bicycle wheels. Lights glowed dimly from behind the curtain windows of houses. On Washington Street, a sudden gust of wind ravaged the elm branches and unfastened their leaves, floating them down thick and slow and soundless. I was halfway across the bridge when I saw him. I stopped. He was on the riverbank. I couldn't make out the face, but it was he, short and small-headed, in my bloated jacket. He stood with the tramp, both of them staring into the blazing gasoline drum. The smoke was thick, particulate. For a second, I stopped breathing. I knew with a sick certainty what he had done. The ashes, given body by the wind floated away from me down the river. He patted the man on the shoulder, reached into his back pocket and slipped some money into those large, newly mittened hands. He started up the bank then and saw me. I was so full of wanting, I thought it would flood my heart. His hands were empty. If I had known then what I knew later, I wouldn't have said the things I did. I wouldn't have told him he didn't understand. But clearly he did. I wouldn't have told him that what he had done was unforgivable, that I wished he had never come, or that he was no father to me. But I hadn't known. And as I waited, feeling the wind change, all I saw was a man coming toward me in a ridiculously oversized jacket, rubbing his black sooted hands, stepping through the smoke with its flecks and flame-tinged eddies, who had destroyed himself yet again in my name. The river was behind him. The wind was full of acid. In a slow float of light, I looked away down at the river. 
On the brink of the freezing, it gleamed in large, balding blisters. The water, where it still moved, was black and braided, and it occurred to me then how it took hours, sometimes days, for the surface of the river to freeze over, to hold in its skin a perfect and crystalline world, and how that world could be shattered by a small stone dropped like a single syllable.